Um, hi, everybody. Um, I see that people are still uh, coming in and out, but as we are already running a little late, I'd like to, to start this panel. Um, my name is Judith Hackmark. I'm a lawyer with the European Center for, for Constitutional and Human Rights. And I have the great pleasure to moderate this panel with three uh, really outstanding experts and outstanding persons. Um, to my left, um, Ida Hoftan, who, um, yeah, after Seema's uh, impressive introduction, it's really hard to, to introduce again. But I'd like to, to mention, or maybe to add some, some of the aspects. Either you're a Namibian activist since, since the 1970s, you're a politician, you have been a member of several um, national assemblies in, in Namibia, but you're also the founder and the chairperson of the Nama Genocide Technical Committee and were among the first, if not the first persons who uh, set the topic of the Oberhererue Nama Genocide, in particular the Nama Genocide, on the political agenda in Namibia since the 1990s and, uh, and continue to do so. So uh, to my right is um, Alexandra Kemmerer. Alexandra Kemmerer is with the Max Planck Institute for Comparative Public and International Law. She is there, she's a senior legal researcher and she's the head of the Institute's Berlin office. Um, most of all, she is uh, a renowned uh, publicist and she is uh, one of the first persons who within the German legal community extensively commented on the relevance of colonialism, on the legacies that are linked to the histories uh, of international law and its ambivalent connection to colonialism. So great pleasure to have you here, Alexandra. And uh, finally, to the right, um, we have uh, John Akuta. John Akuta um, is a lecturer with the University um, of Namibia, and he specializes in human rights law, uh, in international law, he reads administrative law, and he's also the media ombuds person of the University uh, of Namibia. And, um, hmm? of Namibia, apologies. And um, he has worked as a counselor to the Ancestral Lands Commission and uh, with a strong focus on the human rights impact um, that has been set up by the Namibian government recently. So great to have you here, John. Um, so what we're talking about here for the next uh, one hour and 45 minutes will be the topic of addressing colonial injustice uh, through the law. And uh, as Joshua has aptly pointed out, this is an highly uh, ambivalent topic. Your yeah, law can be both used as a tool of abstraction. It has been at the core of the colonial imperial project in itself. Um, at the same time, it is used by uh, activists and um, yeah, as activists, lawyers to address grave injustices that we are dealing with today. Um, I'd like to um, add another aspect to this observation. Law is a highly, um, is a highly political tool. And uh, in the discourse that we are finding ourselves on here in the Oberherero and Nama genocide, where there is, for example, recently a certain openness to use this, again, legal term genocide uh, to describe what happened in Namibia, and um, also more broadly to uh, negotiate and then at least verbally acknowledge um, what, has been, um, what has been done, what has happened um, during the colonial uh, occupation of what is now Namibia. Um, at the same time, it's um, difficult um, to tell when how these, um, you know, how these verbal acknowledgements, how they play out when it comes to, to the concrete, when it comes to the concrete situation of people uh, in Namibia living today, um, when it comes to uh, coming to concrete conclusions and concrete results. And um, I think that um, here on the panel, with the different perspectives from, uh, from activists and from lawyers trained in two different legal systems, we will be able to, um, building on what we have just seen in the keynotes, dig a little deeper of what this then concretely means in the relationship between uh, Germany and Namibia. And um, um, I think in the beginning, um, it would be great to, to hear from you, Ida, um, uh, again in your words, 
what um, the Ovarero and Nama genocide, what it is about, um, what it means for people in Namibia today, and uh, which effects are there that are continuing and um, of relevance for people living in Namibia. Okay, thank you very, very much, Judith. The first thing that I was expecting that I will give something which I have on paper already directly on genocide and repercussions on it. Now, I would like to start of saying that I am Ida Hoffman, founding chairperson of the NAMA genocide discussion and the chairperson of the NAMA genocide technical committee, which means it is a legal registration organization. It is the only one to be recognized with the name on platforms such as this one, both in Namibia and international. Yes, <clears throat> repercussions are a plenty. In fact, repercussions are everyday experiences. The Nama, as victims of the Nama genocide, are subjected. Yes, repercussions are the sole legacy left by the perpetrators of the Nama genocide and especially the extermination order of 1905 issued by the German general Dieter Lothar von Trotter on the orders by the German leader Kaiser Wilhelm II. That extermination made sure that 70% of the Nama has been exterminated, which it is even written and said, wipe them all out. Von Trotter even made sure that the committed Germanies intended to exterminations of the Nama on paper. It is clear to everybody that indeed genocide has been committed by Germany against the Nama so much is clear, there is no disputing of that gruesome fact. There is no way anyone can proudly get up and dispute or defend such gruesome fact. Every report, every investigation, every research such on the event of 1904, 1908, the massacres, the murders, the rapes, the land dispossessions, the human remains still languishing in the Namib desert and in the Kalahari desert. They all bring out the damning evidence. Damning evidence continues Kaiser Holocaust by David Olosoko and Caspar W. Erickson, as well as Reinhard Kostler and Henny Melba, Namibia and German negotiation, the past amongst others. They all pinpoint to the past, the destruction done against the victims. Pointing out to one deed, and the deed is identified as genocide. Genocide perpetrated by Germany against the Nama and the Hereros. This genocide and additional colonial atrocities have set unspeakable repercussions in motions. These repercussions are on the ground today as deceptive as they are, they still continue the genocide that was set in motions over 115 years ago repercussions left behind after the destruction and departure of Germans from Namibia invade every aspect of the life of a Nama victim.
The primary deprivation are the loss of land, loss of life, loss of livestock, loss of culture, tradition, existence as a coherent people, leading to loss of communityhood and peoplehood. Yes, I like to say the word in Afrikaans and hope will be translated in English. Ons menswaardigheid is gevat en diep, diep in die modder gegooi. En ons het ons menswaardigheid verloor. Our human dignity has been taken and thrown in deep down in the drain. We have lost it. We have lost it. The killings and the murders which can cure a long physical, mental, and physiological abuse at such a frequency and intensity, the victims still have physiological and spiritual shocks as well as wounds. This the victims' community have been carrying in their collective awareness as a people now for over 115 years in their history. Tradition, culture, and presence in their emotions from generation to generation. We are not even acknowledged as human beings in the South. We are just nothing, and that is what the Germans have done to us and it has continually even up to now. The stroma of the Nama is indeed inherited. The stroma remains frightening and devastating. It can be argued that this inherited trauma from the generation to generation and its fear is the reason for many dysfunctions in all Nama community across Namibia, there is definitely a strong link. The Nama today are a totally dysfunctional community. Repercussions are plenty. Every social ill and dysfunction known to mankind is prevalent amongst us as victims. The genocide onslaught has destroyed every social principles and means of cohesion. The onslaught has dispersed and scattered the victims all over the southern Africa, from all over Namibia and even to some other parts in Africa, such as Cameroon and Togo. We are talking about repercussions, the consequences of the genocide. Genocide, invasion of the Nama and Herero, has left them dysfunctionally and in dire straits in every sense of the word, including weak family structures and therefore very weak families. Alcohol abuse, marital dysfunctions, homelessness, unemployment, political absence in leadership and other positions of power are the consequences of genocide. The Nama have been cut off from all financial generating platforms. The land disposed Producing their own income and wealth is non-existent. That genocide that was directed against the Nama in Hero is still generating deadly genocide effects against the existence of the group and points to the present day brokenness of the Nama as a people. The Namas are broken people since the day of the German invasion. The nation 
has been broken down and that is where reparation come in. Not compensation, reparation. That is where reparation are called for. To do not compensate what you have broken down. To have to pay it for what you have broken down. To fix it, to repair it. Many victims are on the street, in sex, in prison, in many more under desirable places. It must be thoroughly understood that the genocide, its broader sense, has left numerous victims behind and is still in process of claiming more victims. A closer look at the present day, Nama victims reveal a deeply traumatized and dis dysfunctional people trying to rebuild their life. Rebuilding these lives call for deep commitment. The first order of business call for practical assistance to prevent the downward spiral and has taken hold of the victims. The necessary action calls for device, diverse tools of healing to be put in place for transformation. One single tool such as the ill-fated and discredited special initiative will not do. The issues calls for multiple approaches. Several legal attempts such as the New York U.S. District Court case in New York and Namibia, very own resolution of 2006, unanimously was accepted in the National Assembly, Namibian National Assembly, by our government, uh, in place already. The court case in New York is still dragging on worth an appeal launched recently. Resolution 2006 of Namibian National Assembly of Namibia is being ignored. In the meantime, repercussions against the victims keep on mounting and that is where our attention should be focused urgently. I beseech this gathering as is also the reason of this symposium to focus on the repercussions and to bring about emergency solutions to the problems posed by repercussion. Yes, these are those repercussions. Landlessness. German took our land. Took our things, they took our resources. Social dysfunction. We have lost lost our human dignity. Take it, throw it deep down there in the drain. We are struggling to come out there, but we cannot. Only it can be with your help. High HIV rates of infections. We don't have the money. Go to the hospitals, to the private doctors, wherever. HIV and AIDS, death, yes. In April, I have also buried my daughter. It is there. I don't believe there is a house in Namibia who don't have these kind of problems, but we cannot afford. Everything has been taken away from us. Diamond pieces are sitting here in the houses of the people to show. High crime rates are there, of course, unemployment. High rates of imprisonment is there because we have nothing. 
Violence is there. Violent death, death by violences. High death rates over all even of curable diseases because of lack of access to basic medicines and lack of affordability of medical service. High rates of stillborn babies. Death while giving birth because you are there far on the farm. There's no transport to go to a clinic. You don't have anything. Early childhood diseases and death. High percentage school dropouts. High teenage pregnancy. When you talk about presentations of school dropout, people like to talk about now, but in the past also, I am one of them was only for five years, six, six, but then I said five years because the six years was hard. Just of course that I was not having a panty. The panty which I was having was full of holes. And I have to do exercises. This boy, girl, boy, girl, I have to bend. But I cannot tell my male teacher, this is my problem. He understood me as I am temper, just come and clap me in and I walk out from there. So we are safe having problems since those years, even up to now. High teenage pregnancy is there because let's make babies. Let's go and buy groceries. Those are the language, how our young ones will be misused and have been misused. But I thank you very much for that we could have this meeting and that some of us can speak and talk our heart out. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah, the thanks go back to you, Ida. Um, John, we um, we have now heard from already from several speakers about uh, the topics of transgenerational poverty and also of land dispossession as, as a complex colonial repercussion. And uh, I know that particularly in Namibia there is a um, quite heated and vivid land debate going on right now. And uh, also in this debate, uh, the law um, is used uh, by all sides um, to um, put forward their arguments. And um, I would be pleased to hear from you your stance um, on this ongoing debate and uh, the, law, the role the law is playing and that lawyers play or maybe should play in this context. Thank you very much, Judith. Yes. Thank you so much. And again, for the organizers, uh, thank you very much for the invitation. Um, as was mentioned in the introduction, my name is John, as you can see, John Nakuta. Um, I had a privilege. Our president, in the beginning of February, appointed a commission to inquire into the issue of ancestral land in the country. And to my surprise, I was asked to be one of those uh, the lawyers that they wanted to contract to assist them in trying to understand the ancestral land issue from a human rights point of view. I'm saying I was very surprised because we had our second land conference uh, in November last year, and I was very critical about how the government, our present government, is addressing the issue of ancestral land. And to my surprise, uh, they asked me to join them to better understand what is the legal position of ancestral land under international law, and then, of course, whether our, whether our domestic laws make provision for ancestral land. Unlike South Africa, that took about, about five, six years to sit down and to write their constitution, through various participation. They had thousands and thousands of submissions by the general public in terms of how 
and what should be included in the, in the South African Constitution. Ours was not like that. Our Constitution was written in a record period of about two months. Um, and the then chairperson of our Constitution, Constitutional Assembly, is Constituent Assembly, Constituent Assembly, uh, our present president, Hage Geinkop, is very proud that we took such a short space of time to write our country's constitution. Why did it happen? Is because, and I'm coming to the point what you want to ask me, that you ask me. Um, because we were given a template by the, what is that group? The Western Contact Group, consisting of Germany, Canada, France, and the fourth one, the US. They gave us a template of a constitution. And that template emphasized, put emphasis on civil and political rights. It was, and it is totally silent on the issue of economic, social, and cultural rights. But also, very importantly, that template put tremendous emphasis on property rights. Article 16 of the Namibian Constitution provides for, rightly so, private property rights. But unlike the South African Constitution, which also provides for property rights, the South African Constitutional Writers they realized that their people suffered land dispossession. So whilst first guaranteeing private property rights, the South African constitutional drafters then went further and said, and people don't agree, that those ones that has lost land after 1913 as a result of some colonial laws, discriminatory laws, has a right to claim equitable redress. And it goes further that the parliament shall uh, make a law, and act a law that would give content to the provision of restitution. The Namibian constitution is utterly and conspicuously silent on the issue of ancestral land, on the issue of restoration. Meanwhile, law, a law was passed in the 1904s, 1905s, which provide for, and Joseph spoke about it, law was used to achieve some of these injustices. And the first expropriation orders was made to expropriate land from the Namas and the Ovaherero people. Our constitution doesn't talk about that. And so now for the past three years, people are saying, for how long are we going, are we going to have a situation where the migrant settlers, people that came in the early eight, 1800s, early 90s came and took our land by conquest, by fraudulent means, through protection orders, which cannot be termed otherwise but by theft, by false pretenses. For how long shall we have a situation that the natives are landless, that those who, to whom the, long, the land belong to are the farm workers today. And those who stole the land happen to be the landowners. And for that reason, people are saying, we want our land back, rightfully so. And for that reason, our president appointed a commission of inquiry into the ancestral land issue. And I had a privilege to work, as I said, as the legal expert on this issue and trying to advise um, the commission on the, whether there is a legal case to be made. 
And of course, we know international law, at least through Convention 169 of the ILO, as well as the United Nations Declaration of, uh, on the Rights of Indigenous People, UNDRIP, expressly recognize that indigenous people have their rights to the lands and territories that they previously owned or occupied. And we are using this notion because um, the African Commission on Human and People's Rights as in two cases in particular, the African Commission on Human and People's Rights has used the UN DRIP to, to, to find that Kenya has violated the rights of the Android people by evicting them from their ancestral homes. Likewise, in 2017, the African Court on Human and People's Rights has used similarly the UN DRIP to find that Kenya has violated international law by evicting the Oklik people from their ancestral land. So what we're saying, in Namibia we've got the problem that the biggest problem in addressing our ancestral land issue lies in our constitution. Our constitution, as I said, overemphasize the issue of um, private property and is conspicuously silent on the issue of re, uh, restoring the, the land that people got. Before I conclude, the commission in their way to try and get information from the people conducted uh, various public hearings. Wohang mentioned in the beginning that our compatriots back home from the German and the Afrikaans community usually doesn't participate. And this was exactly the case. Very few uh, German, uh, Germans, German-speaking Namibians, Germans in Namibia, attended these public hearings because the R word is almost a curse word. The R word meaning the question of reparations. But people are saying, and I totally agree with uh, Joshua mentioned, I made here a point, I said that through my uh, working with the commission behind the scenes, it is very clear that people are not just asking for money. And as he said, people are asking for reparations. And in terms of international law, compensation is but just one of them. From the submissions that was made by the people to the commission, people are asking for restitution. Give back our land. And if it is not possible, pay compensation. Strikingly, the Namibian constitution provides for expropriation with just compensation. However, not once has it been used to take land from the people so as a way to, receive, to achieve restorative justice. And this is the point that you've made, the question of political will. In Namibia, in, in addition to the fact that the law does not currently, as it stands, expressly provides for um, restitution, there's also a lack of political will. We've got land programs. Uh, one of our land redistribution programs is the resettlement program. But in the resettlement program, the people that has lost the land through genocide and through uh, other colonialism, because in 1955, uh, on one fateful day, the South Africans came, they bundled the Sun community that was staying in Etosha Park into or onto the trucks 
and they instructed them to just get out of here and drop them immediately out of outside the park. Today, as we speak, the Sun community is amongst the poorest of the poor. In the name of converse, uh, uh, conservation, Namibian government is doing exactly the same. We've got uh, one of the other Sun groups in the Bobwata National Park, somewhere in our Zambezi region, the former Caprivi, Western Caprivi region. As we speak, the government is telling the queer community to get out of Babwata National Park. So it's, we are dealing with a situation that the government is not sensitive to the historical land injustices that was uh, suffered by the people. So basically, in conclusion, basically what I'm saying, people are asking for restitution. They are asking for compensation. They are asking for satisfaction. Apologize to what you did to us. Raise monuments giving recognition to some of the people that got killed in the genocide and um, also through other means. And do some rehabilitation because as Ida just mentioned, the nation has been traumatized by the genocide and the land dispossession that they suffered. And people are also saying in conclusion, we want there to be a guarantee of no repetition. Because, to paraphrase Nelson Mandela, when he delivered his inaugural speech, he said that never again will such bad things that has happened under apartheid happen in a new South Africa. And this is the kind of commitment that people want the Namibian government to make with the assist, of course, with the collaboration of the German government and all those things. And for the German government, I want to use this opportunity. It's not charity. If people are asking for compensation, it's not because they are poor Africans. It is because their rights has been violated. I said it in March in Namibia, and I want to repeat it again. Do not conflate. Do not conflate the development aid that the German government is giving to the Namibian government with reparations. It's two different things. Thank you. It's two different things. Reparations you owe to the ones whose rights you have violated. It is something that you owe to them by virtue of human rights law. Development aid. It's not a legal obligation, and correct me if I'm wrong. You can stop the development aid tomorrow, and no one can take you on for what that reason. But in terms of reparation, you owe this to correct the wrongs that you have done. Thank you very much. Thanks. Thanks a lot, John. Uh, Alexandra, I'd like to, to take up a notion uh, from John's contribution, the notion of the conspicuous silence. Um, when it comes to uh, the, the German political discourse and uh, the legal discourses in particular, for a long time um, there was um, not much discussion at all about either the colonial past, the repercussions, and the entanglement of present-day international law with histories of, of colonialism. And I believe Reinhard Kössler even coined the term for this colonial uh, amnesia. Um, and so, um, is there still a colonial amnesia uh, within the German legal discourse today? And if there's something changed in, in how far? Yeah, thank 
Okay. Yeah, thank you very much, Judith. Um, I would also like to thank the organizers for setting up this event and this entire series, which really is in itself a great contribution to um, also the internal discourse within German legal scholarship and German society. But I would first of all, all, all like to thank all of you who participate here today, and in particular the participants who came from Namibia for sharing your testimonies, your memories, your, also your grief, um, and for really enabling and facilitating a broader transnational discourse on these topics, which goes way beyond the limits of the law. Because the means of the law are limited, John has written a wonderful short contribution in the publication that uh, has also been released today, which is also a major contribution, I think, to the entire debate that we are uh, having here. And the means of the law are very limited. And as Wolfgang Kalleck said in his introductory words, it's a shame that lawyers still need to discuss the de decolonize, decolonization of the law. But maybe it's not so much a shame, and we will be discussing it for many years, for ages to come, because the colonial trajectory is a past that will remain. It's a lasting past. It will change over time in the way how we deal with it, but it will be with us. It will be with us as German lawyers, as representatives of German legal scholarship and legal institutions and legal practitioners, but it will also be with us as human beings. <laughs> And we need to realize that the means of the law are limited. Political discourse is decisive. Law is embedded in a democratic political process and political discourse. And therefore, I think the work that ECCHR is doing here is so important because while being at the, at the spearhead of uh, strategic litigation in Germany and throughout Europe, you also always embed your cases and your projects within wider publics. You're connecting lawyers in Germany and beyond and have created your own transnational community, but you also connect publics in a trans on a transnational level. And what you have done by bringing this debate to Germany, but also bringing it, taking it back to Namibia and creating this kind of exchange that uh, is also happening here today, is really a, a great contribution to this emerging discourse in law that only can take off and really get a start and also have a political impact if it is embedded in a broader public debate. Of course, we still meet profound amnesia or as Michael Rigner has recently uh, coined it, uh, an aphasia an inability to speak. We don't have words to address the memories that we, have, we need to face. We also don't have words and concepts to deal adequately on the legal level with these problems and trajectories. But there are also signs of hope, and I will point you to some of these signs of hope that I can see. And I even would say that in the two years that have passed since the first symposium of this series took place here at the Akademie der Künste almost two years ago, we see an emergence and a popping up of workshops, symposia, talks on colonial issues in different disciplines, in German academia, in broader publics, uh, and also in the legal field, which traditionally is always somewhat behind because, um, well, for many reasons we uh, have not just a scholarly discourse and a, a public discourse, but we also need to see how we can frame and turn politics into legal instruments and how we can uh, correspond with a legal practice that also then has to apply these instruments and concepts. So there are some changes and some motions and within uh, legal scholarship we see a growing impact of trail discourses, the presence of trail scholars in German legal debates, in legal institutions. You might need to explain trail. Um, trail is third world approaches to international law. That's a critical strand of legal scholarship, um, coined mostly by scholars 
from uh, the Global South, but located mostly in uh, Western legal institutions. The first meetings happened 20 years ago at Harvard Law School uh, under the aegis of David Kennedy, and then um, uh, the network grew, and now we have what you might even call a third generation of trail scholars who really also try to reconstruct international law uh, as a practice and as an academic endeavor um, by connecting it to traditions from the global south and try to uh, take into account also the experiences of the global south and of course also the ongoing and lasting um, trajectories of the colonial past which are still of course to be seen and to be felt in inequalities in local communities as we have uh, heard also in a very impressive and um, and touching way in Ida's testimony uh, today. Uh, so that's, that's the, the trail um, group, and uh, this is also much more received or increasingly <coughs> received within German legal academia. We see in international law endeavors to rethink the concept of intertemporality, which is one of the uh, stepping stones or, or also the the blocking uh, elements when it comes to transnational uh, litigation in the field, intertemporality, that means that uh, legal concepts have to be interpreted in the way that they were interpre interpreted at the time uh, of a specific historical um, event. So there are, there are endeavors to um, read intertemporality in a more contextual way, to reconstruct and reinterpret historical events in a way that not only takes into account concepts and uh, legal theories of European writers at the time in European international law, but also takes into account and tries to reconstruct um, the corresponding practices. What happened at the, at the ground? What happened on the ground? How was it understood? How were treaties understood that were signed between uh, parties? Um, and these are ways to try to take a grip uh, on the often very ambivalent practice and also the often um, very ambivalent uh, doc documentation of colonial um, land taking, for example, uh, at, the, at the colonial um, times. So here, of course, my colleague Matthias Goldman, who has also been part of this series of symposia and has also been uh, a participant uh, in the events in uh, Namibia, Namibia earlier this year, uh, is certainly one of the leading, um, the leading voices uh, trying to find more reconstructive approaches. Um, another more important voice, sorry, uh, is certainly Mamadou Hebye, uh, an international lawyer based at Geneva and also a, a clerk um, and a researcher at the International Court of Justice who, um, who tries to develop a hermeneutical um, approach to, uh, international, to historical events in international law um, by taking into account the materialities, taking a more ethnographic approach and look into uh, the historical events from a sociological point of view. Um, and his writings also have some resonance within, even within German uh, legal scholarship. There is also a debate about the the question of legal standing, the question of who speaks for the colonized, Jochen von Bernstorff, um, who is also part of a number of projects in the field currently, and one of the important voices in international law in Germany, dealing with um, post-coloniality and colonial law and the colonial repercussions within um, law and, and the means how to deal with these colonial repercussions, has just published an article um, together with uh, Jakob Schuler in the Heidelberg Journal. Unfortunately, it's still only in German, but I'm quite sure that this will come out also in English translation quite soon. Uh, there he tries to construct, and quite con convincingly so, uh, to construct a right to hear and to have participate the uh, different groups that were affected by colonization. That is, of course, an issue that in Germany has been discussed uh, in the process leading to the, in the end, fortunately successful um, 
um, um, retribution of uh, Hendrik Witboy's VIP and Bible to Namibia. There was a case at the administrative court uh, in Baden-Württemberg where we had a discussion whether uh, local communities, whether the Ovaherero and the Nama people could uh, make claims and participate in these proceedings. And uh, this has prompted Jochen von Bernstorff to develop an approach that from, um, from human rights law and from sources in uh, uh, the human rights law on the rights of indigenous people uh, <coughs> constructs also an obligation under international law um, by uh, colonizing states, former colonizing states, to create means and ways and procedures for participation for the people that were affected by colonization. Um, th this is also an interesting response to the report by Benedict Sawa and Felvin Saar, which most of you will be certainly aware of, uh, which has also been widely discussed in Germany, a report dealing with restitution laws of colonial objects from museums and, and collections. A very important political intervention, I would say, but on the legal level also quite disappointing uh, document because uh, still the, the report speaks only about state-state obligations, so it's only states that can claim restitution of colonial objects and also the, the entire set of legal technicalities uh, remains somewhat in the back of the entire document and of course this <coughs> precisely this precisely is the point where we need to discuss more but we need to go into the technical details and we need also to discuss new and really creative ways how to have the most um, the most extensive participation by people affected of colonial wrongs uh, also in procedures of uh, restitution and um, recompensation. So there's still much, much to do. I don't want to go further into legal technicalities and details, but I would like to add, and this is really my response also to Judith's initial question, um, a kind of my own testimony. What is the reason for this amnesia in, uh, of colonial pasts in German law and German legal academia? Why have we not discussed these issues for a long time? Why is it only now that also in a really striking dynamics where questions of the genocide uh, um, uh, on the uh, over Herero and Nama people, uh, the question of colonial objects the question of how these objects should be dealt with here in Berlin, how we should relate to the past, to the past of this place here, of, of Berlin's colonial past, how we should re-situate re ourselves in a global world and in a, in a new, um, in a new decay, in a, in a new uh, world of global interconnectedness. Why is this happening now and why didn't it happen for a long time? The reasons are on the one hand side, theoretical and historical reasons. German legal scholarship is quite conceptual, it is theoretical, it is state-centered. German international law has a tradition which is deeply rooted in the traditions of German public law and public law theory. So it's clear <coughs> that it's a very state-focused um, enterprise and also a very conceptually oriented uh, enterprise. So there's not much room or has not been much room for empirical research, for anthropology, for approaches that are more phenomenological and aim to take into account also the realities and the materialities um, of the law. Then of course there is a kind of institutional and sociological uh, environment in which has to do historically with the kind of frozen memory of German colonialism. This has been discussed also throughout the series and you find many uh, contributions also in the publication where uh, this is dealt with, of course, the uh, overarching relevance of memorizing the Nazi past and the Holocaust, which kind of overshadowed other kinds of historical memories also in the legal and political field. Then, of course, 
uh, German legal scholarship as an entire society was trapped in a Cold War environment where you could even speak, as Philip Dunn has recently done, about a double amnesia, both in West Germany and in East Germany, in the, in the German Democratic Republic, where both uh, societies, both countries, also both uh, legal communities were kind of trapped in the Cold War reality of the superpowers. So even when German legal scholars thought about international comparative law or about colonial pasts, they mainly thought about colonial pasts or decolonizing countries in this kind of Cold War framework. There was not much room for German colonialism and uh, no connection to what had happened in German colonial pasts. People who um, did research, did empirical research in um, decolonizing countries, went on Ford Foundation scholarships, they became Yale Global Fellows and so on and so forth. So they were really embedded in a co completely different trajectory that was not related to Germany's colonial past. Due to this, due to this strong Cold War um, embeddedness of uh, comparative legal research in international law and comparative law. Also, this kind of global outlook ended quite suddenly with the end of the Cold War. So we see in the 1990s and 2000s a complete silence and really a kind of focus on, on Europe um, and focus on a kind of re-imagination of Im international law and reconstruction, a strong emphasis on international institutions, on courts, um, and new developments in uh, creating a post-war world order, but um, any kind of outreach to decolonizing societies um, is then really uh, taken to a sudden halt. And in, only now it's uh, slowly re-emerging. And to see it re-emerging, we realize that we also need to, uh, to trigger some changes within German legal scholarship and German legal education and to really transnationalize it, but also make it more open in terms of methodological diversity, integrating experiences from anthropology, ethnography, bring people really to the ground, let them experience legal practice, rethink uh, legal history in a way that also integrates non-Eurocentric perspectives and tries to reread our own tradition also in a peripheral way and uh, take us out of the center and teaches us to rethink our trajectories in a more critical and more reflexive way. This does not mean doing away with positive uh, trajectories of German law and German legal tradition, but it means really to, to resituate it and to think uh, in a fresh and more reflexive way about our heritage, our memories, also our responsibilities, uh, not only as German citizens, but also as German lawyers who are part of a tradition that has partaken uh, in the colonial endeavor. And it means also to open up to exchange with legal communities throughout the world, but also with citizens throughout the world, and to share our positionalities, uh, our trajectories, to talk not only about the concepts we have, and the legal opinions we have, and to be defensive or be apologetic. And I hope this, what I just said, does not sound apologetic because I think it's really meant to be, or it is a contribution to an enhanced um, transnational discourse where we try to create an intersubjective understanding among lawyers, among legal communities, among lawyers and politicians, but also in the end among our communities um, and uh, ourselves as global citizens. I want to leave it with that. I hope that was somehow an answer to your question and I'm looking forward mm -hmm. to Absolutely. the questions. Yeah, thank you very much to you and <laughs> Alexander. And um, actually to the, to the three of you for um, giving us such a uh, both very broad but also a very founded and very deep introduction into the complexities that we face on a political and legal level uh, when we start try to start with this endeavor of addressing colonial uh, injustice through the law. 
And um, I think that um, when it comes, um, you know, when this, these questions that you have all have touched upon, when in one aspect where they crystallize or they translate into, uh, into very concrete cases, um, those are, uh, on the example of Germany and Namibia, those are uh, two situations that we are um, currently seeing. Um, I think one is um, the case that was brought by the Oberherrero and Nama in the United States um, before the U.S. District Court of the Southern District in New York, which is now in, in the second instance. So um, it has been a negative decision in the beginning, but the case is, is still pending and it continues to have a, a relevance. Um, the other aspect is that um, in several years, since 2015, um, and I think those pr two aspects are linked, we are in Germany, um, is negotiating through two special envoys um, about um, what uh, the Namibian side would cause reparations and apology acknowledgement of the colonial harm and uh, what in the website of the German Federal Foreign Office um, is described as Vergangenheitsbewältigung, so if translated freely um, uh, addressing the past. And um, while, while these negotiations um, seem to have been stuck for a long time, there are hints that there might finally at some point be uh, a conclusion between the two states, the German and the Namibian state. Um, but what has been criticized throughout this process was the lack of inclusion of the communities of the Oberhadero and Nama, and, uh, which then again was a reason why the case in New York was brought. Um, so I wonder, and I uh, would leave it to you to see uh, who of you would like to take a first stance, um, if you could comment on this, how uh, does in this concrete example of the situation of the negotiations and the court case, um, how do these uh, general observations uh, play out? Which, ro law, which role should the law play? Which role should lawyers um, play? And um, how should, should such processes that aim at addressing uh, past wrongs be, be framed in a meaningful way? I don't know, I understand very well because it's grade five, ne? and it's English. But immediately, uh, I was, I was uh, wanted to ask um, our lawyer here in the middle, what she was uh, asking the question of why have this discussion not taken place before, and you know, only now. And I would like to answer that part to say that um, it was the Germans up to 1915 where the South Africans came in. And even when the South Africans had came in, there was no way for us to talk about genocide. Uh, and it is now after independence, 1990, when uh, <coughs> Namibia got its independence and then with the first Lent conference. I was thinking even if I could bring the documents together with me, but then it was the 29 June where I decided to call our Nama traditional leaders together, special the Bondoswats. That was at my kindergarten in Katutura. And that they came there for the land conference issue, and I took it up with them because I, it was in my mind for many years where my grandfather was asking me to take to come in in this discussion of, of uh, uh, this genocide issue. But for me, as a Swapo, I was always saying, "No, that is tribalism, and that is that is that, and that is that, and that is that." Not to be involved. But wonderful, 1991, I started. And that is what the Namibia community. Secondly, 1992, when one lady, Linda Galabawa, invited me, asked me to join the uh, discussion where the Namibia Dutch Stuftung have organized and wanted to talk about cultural programs. I said, that meant we cannot talk about cultural programs. Because what you have done to us, your ancestors have killed our ancestors. And it is now time that we must talk about genocide. 
They tried to push me there in a corner, wanted to, I must tell how much money we went. I said, that I cannot take that decision. That is from the traditional leaders. We must come together. I went to my traditional leaders. Okay. And nothing has happened. 1999, I called them together in Kitman's Hope, together with the people also. And we talk about it. But immediately, you know, to stand up and go to the government, although it was not there, but it was in all the newspapers and everything. It was there. 2006, I was in parliament. Where late, Chief Kaimo Riruako brought the genocide motion in parliament. And he was talking about, on behalf of the heroes, lucky enough that I was there. And I could also stand up and say, but what about the Namas? The Namas was also killed. And then the discussion goes also in parliament. And if it goes in parliament, it means the TV is there. You know, the nation start hearing what we are discussing. And the interests of our people have come in. I brought the Hereros and the Namas together in my, my house on my front stoop. And that was with late Chief Kaimo Riruako and late Chief Fredericks. And we come together and start talk now, where they have also decided and have done to write the memorandum, sign the memorandum. Um, that is how we are coming on, on and even up to now that we are, we are busy with this, where I am even also busy now with a memorial park, a museum, because when the, the Bible was also being asked and, and so on, I am the one in all the medias who was asking for bring back the remains, the skulls, all the artifacts we are there, bring back the Bible and the whip of, of, of uh, uh, Hendrik Wettboy. And I was very, very glad when there was some misunderstanding. The Germans, those who are working close together with me, asked me, Ida, what did you say? What did you say? And I wrote the letter, which goes even also there to the Ministry of Science, Research and Arts here in Germany. And that is how the Bible and the WIP have come. And that is together with the Nama Genocide Technical Committee and the community. So I hope I have at least answer you, you know, why not before, but it is. But lastly, let me, I wanted to ask you, uh, the lawyers here and the community, the people who are sitting here, is that we talk about reparation. We want development in our regions. We want to see and want the help that our people can get their human dignity back. Also, you know, of can say, but is it me? That is very important. And therefore, help us also. Let there be a board of trustee when reparation will be paid and is paid. In a board of trustee where the representative of the German government the Namibian government, the Nama traditional leaders, the Hereros, the, the, the technical committees, from both, both Nama genocide technical committee, to, to know those people, let there be lawyers, let there be special outstanding bookkeepers, special outstanding uh, 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 auditors, and the advisors. Then I hope and believe the money, when it is being paid, will be done in the right way where all the others, the effective groups, will also benefit out of it. I'm not saying it is only for the Namas and the because war was war, where the other tribes was also in. And when we build also hospitals in Kipmanswap, it doesn't say that if you are Ovambo or you are who cannot be there. It is for the Namibian nation. But let's do that for the money case. Let it be done in the right way with a board of trustees. I thank you. Yeah, um, 
think um, this is actually a good place to um, to turn to questions and I would um, or reactions um, and I would first um, want to open uh, for questions within the panel. So John, if you would like to make a remark or react to this, it would be great. I want to re uh, react to what Alexander mentioned: the right to be heard and the issue of participation. Um, very sadly, in August. Our High Court threw out a case uh, that was brought by the HICOM community. I, I mentioned in 1955, the HICOM community was thrown out of Etosha. So eight people from this community went to our court and asked the court to allow them to bring a case for the restoration of the ancestral land at Tosha um, on behalf of the whole HICOM community. The issue of local standi that you've mentioned. One of the sad realities of Namibia, our legal system, is that we are, approach we are having a very narrow approach, very restrictive approach as to who can be heard by a court of law. It is only those that are directly, substantially uh, affected by the outcome of a legal matter. And you cannot claim to bring some, a, a case to our court in terms of our standards of local standi in the name of the whole group. You will have to go and get proof of all those people whom you claim to be speaking on behalf. And for that reason, on technical grounds, the matter was thrown out because the eight activists that gave the government about eight options. Give back Etosha to us. If not, let us share in the royalties. Give, pay us royalties because you are getting such a lot of money. They gave the government eight options, but those eight options were not even looked at by our courts, simply because the issue of local standi, which is very narrow, and that is a challenge within our legal system. On the issue of participation, Namibia has at least for the past three, four years been under the microscope of the UN treaty bodies uh, with, when it comes to the issue of indigenous people's rights. In, in our country, we've got the problem that the issue of ancestral land, for example, cannot be adequately advanced because our country, like most uh, African countries, does not want to give or does not recognize the notion of indigenous people. The argument is that all blacks are aboriginal, are indigenous to Africa. So it is divisive to talk about indigenous people in the African context. However, the African Commission and Human and people on Human and People's Rights have said, indigenous people for Africa has a specific human rights context. It does not mean that every uh, African qualifies for the designation of indigenous people. Uh, it is those ones that are having a special bond with the land, those ones that are usually dominated by the, uh, subjected by the dominant groups in their society, and, and for that reason, all of us are not. So it is for this reason that I'm saying, um, the focus of the UN treaty bodies, in fact, on the 11th of December, Namibia is supposed to um, give a detailed report to the, commission, to, the, to the committee on the elimination of all forms of racial dic discrimination at the UN level, the treaty body, in terms of what they are doing in terms of getting the indigenous people to participate in, in issues that affects them, to what extent has Namibia gone about to give title to the land that 
these indigenous communities and populations have lost. So there are some signs of hope to use your word. Thank you very much. Uh, yeah, first of all, I would like to come back to, to Judith's question on the impact of the case in New York, which many of you will have been following quite closely on, uh, on the discourse and also on the legal discourse. Um, I mean, it's no secret when I, when I say that also now in the second instance, there's not much of, an, of a prospect that this will have a positive uh, outcome, this case. Um, just because of the legal situation. I mean, it's a very tricky thing to bring a case under the Alien Torts statute and uh, even also in the light of a more restrictive interpretation of that statute in recent uh, US Supreme Court jurisprudence. So that will most likely not be a successful, um, a successful proceeding and a successful case. But it will be successful and I think it's it's already been successful on the level of its symbolic significance that you see bringing people, bringing victims uh, a case to um, a court in a third country uh, and litigating um, their case and making their claims heard and also addressing and having a global public that communicates these events and also the underlying, of course, the underlying history, the underlying um, the un underlying uh, violations of law uh, to a global uh, audience and just make it be seen. But of course, that, that's also one of the dangerous things about that kind of uh, proceedings because um, strategic litigation is a good thing on a symbolic level, um, but the law and litigation should also always be embedded in a political process and it needs to be reconnected to a political and to a democratic um, discourse. And therefore, uh, from a German perspective, I think we need to strive for having that discussion here, having it in Namibia, having it in the communities that are affected by these issues and not uh, having a need uh, for people to bring it to a court somewhere in New York, in the Southern District of New York. The, I, can, I can understand your impatience with the slowness of the legal process. And of course we all would be better off if we would have adequate legal means and the legal language and instruments and procedures to deal adequately with our shared and at the same time divided past. But the law is a slow thing. And I also understand when we have heard um, quite sharp critique against the German govern government throughout this afternoon. They don't hear us, they don't see us. But the government is also representing a society. And it's representing a society where we also have deeper and ever-growing divisions within society. So it's important to take these issues to the political level, to discuss it in our publics, to make it a case that, is, that affects people, that addresses uh, people and it addresses the people who are the subject of the democratic legitimation of our societies. And I think that's an important point. Unfortunately, these things take time. They can't, can't be done overnight. Sometimes we would dream to just make a case and bring it to a court and have a decision and have reparations, have money flowing, but that's not how it works. That not, that's not how international law works. It's a slow thing. It can do only very little, and it just needs to be part of a political process and, and of um, political realities. And I'm confident that we bring this ahead step by step. We have heard that also within Namibia, there are many difficulties in um, addressing the, the, the problems of plurality within society in an adequate, uh, in an adequate way. Uh, that also makes us aware why it is that 
also from the German government side, we cannot just easily do away with everything, easily do away with the nation state that has been the, um, the, the cornerstone of the international legal order for, for centuries and also provide some kind of stability within that system. Of course, we need to rethink how we also integrate local communities, how we transnationalize also international law really in a sense that we can make people's voices heard, even if they are not represented adequately on the ground by their own government, or even if we have some uh, serious problems of discrimination um, uh, and human rights uh, violations. Um, but it would be just mistaken to think that we can just have clean slate and do away with all the instruments that we have at hand. We need to transform these instruments. We need to transform these legal instruments. We need to broaden the political and public discourse on these issues. And of course have uh, a clear mind and a clear goal in transforming these things, but it will take time. Thanks again, Alexandra, and thanks also um, to all of us for bearing with us now for these uh, three hours that we have, like, dig deep into the, in the topic of colonial injustice. Um, we have a few minutes more left before the break to take, uh, to take several questions. And I would brief ask you to briefly mention uh, your name and if you want your affiliation and uh, to really focus on, on question less than comments. <laughs> mm. Thank you. My name is Michael Ujake. I live in Berlin. I'm an actor. I'm a writer. Um, my question is to uh, our mother here, Ida Hoffman, and my brother, John Nakuta. I didn't want to come to this uh, lecture because I thought to myself, there are too many lectures. It is like praying, too many prayers. I heard somebody in the beginning, in the opening uh, statements, uh, use the word ignorance. And I think we are missing the point. I think we are talking too much. I think we are small people, powerless people, who are making demands on people who are rich, who are powerful, who have the means and the disposition to do away with all of Africa if they feel the need for it. We are not dealing with people who are ignorant of what happened in Africa, in Asia, in Latin America. We are not dealing with ignorant people we are dealing with people who are arrogant. People who know what they have done. And the attitude is, we have done this to you. You know we have done this to you. But what do you want to do about it? What do you want to do about it? This is the attitude we are dealing with. Let us be truthful to ourselves and stop wasting time and energy coming from Africa to talk to Europeans about what Europeans have done to Africa and Asia and Latin America and the rest of the world. We are wasting our time. Europeans don't see other people as human beings. Let us be truthful to ourselves. It is sickening. It is frustrating. It drives me mad. Am I lying? Does anyone sitting here today think I am lying? Is anyone sitting here today think that I am lying? That Europe does not know what it has done to the rest of the world? Is anyone here really, really of the belief that Europe does not know what it has done to the rest of the world, that Europe is sorry, that Europe is one day going to apologize to the world, going to make things right? 
Is anyone here? If anyone here believes that, please raise your hand. Please raise your hand. We are wasting our time. We are wasting our time. What I am waiting for is that the rest of the world, you know, Africa, Asia, Latin America, that we one day say we got balls and get angry and tell Europe, bis hier und nicht weiter. You know, I don't Would know. Would you like to react? This, this is, this, I'm sorry, this is all I can say. I can't, I can't say anymore. Thank you very much. My brother, I can hear your anger and I understand your anger. But there's a saying that says that don't think that one man can't change the world. Indeed, it is the only thing that ever changed the world. We were fighting our liberation struggle against one of the mightiest armies. In fact, the South African leaders said the South African flag, and I'm paraphrasing, will never go down in South Africa. But on the 21st of March, 1990, we cried when we saw the South African flag being lowered. We were fighting against those mighty fool, those powerful, the same for South Africa. But for today, we are sitting in an independent Namibia and in a democratic South Africa. I actually appreciate the consciousness that is being um, cultivated amongst the Germans. Because unlike in, South Af unlike in Namibia, where the local German population does not support, they don't want to hear about this. At least here, I get the sense that people want to begin to understand and through that can also then exert their own kind of pressures on the German and other colonial powers. So I don't, I don't agree with you that we are small people, that we are powerless people. I'll give you another example that happened yesterday back home. Two weeks ago, we've got a problem of corruption in Namibia. You might have seen the documentary of the fishing rod files. One young man from the University of Namibia organized just via social media, called for when that documentary was released, called for an impromptu demonstration. Wednesday. On Friday, we were marching. We called for the arrest of two of our ministers. As we speak, they appeared in court this morning. Don't you say that one person cannot change the world. Indeed, it is the only thing that can change the world. That's my words to you. Okay, thanks, John. Um, I think um, we will take one more question, then go to the break. Um, is there any? Ah, yeah, over there. Yeah. Hi, I'm uh, Yashar. I lived in Namibia until May, uh, working for the Friedrich Ebert Foundation, but I'm not working for them anymore. I just live in Berlin and um, kind of figuring out what to do next. I'm also a lawyer, and since a lot of uh, things have been said about property, I wanted to ask you, um, uh, all of you, do you believe that a solution of um, 
injustice in Namibia as possible within the system of private property? Or do you think that um, the abolishing, abolishing private property would be a better way to um, achieve justice for everyone? No, we cannot abolish private property. Because then it means you cannot, the cell phone that you are having would be abolished because then we won't have those things. So now, and as I said in the beginning, and, we sh uh, and we've got case law that actually confirms that, uh, the notion that the property clause in our constitution only provides for private property, the Western notion of private property, has been dispelled by the African Court on Human and People's Rights in 2017. In 2017, in the Oki case, the African Court on Human and People's Rights said that property means both individual property as well as collective property. So what needs to be done, um, the clause property must be interpreted in a broad, if, if evolutionary and purposive manner, so as to accommodate uh, group rights of indigenous populations and communities that own, because uh, for Africa, the notion of private property is actually a, it's, it was something that was introduced through the colonialists. And it is for this reason that some of us are asking, so why? when we were sitting to draft our constitution, why did we not capture the notion of collective property into our constitution? But be that as it may, it is not being, but we take cue from the interpretation of both the African Commission on Human and People's Rights and the African Court on Human and People's Rights that we cannot confine the notion of property only to, to guarantee private property. And with that, I would say um, we go to the break and continue our discussions there. Thank you very much to all the panelists. Thank you.